Welcome to the Talking Poem Podcast. I'm your host, Charlie Green. On each episode, I invite a guest to bring in any poem they'd like to talk about for any reason. We'll talk about what excites us, what delights us, maybe what frustrates us, and we'll follow the poem and the conversation wherever they turn. Afterward, our guest will share a poem of hers, and then we'll have a little bit of silliness in the game. I'm delighted to have as my guest today, Diane Mehta. Diane was born in Frankfurt, grew up in Bombay and New Jersey, studied in Boston, and now makes her home in New York City. She's the author of two poetry collections, Tiny Extravaganzas, out just last year from Aerosmith Press, and Forest with Castanets from Four Way Books. Her essay collection, Happier Far, comes out next year, 2025, and new and recent work is in The New Yorker, Virginia Quarterly Review, Kenyon Review, American Poetry Review, and A Public Space. Her writing has been recognized by the Peter Heinig Literary Award, the Cafe Royal Cultural Foundation, and fellowships at Civitella Ranieri and Yado. She was an editor at a public space, Pen America and Guernica. Her latest project is a poetry cycle connected to the Divine Comedy, as is the writer of the poem she's brought in. He's also connected to the Divine Comedy. And she's also collaborating with musicians to invent a new way of working through sound together and working on a long-term project with the new Chamber Ballet. Diane, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. So you've brought in... Kieran Carson's ekphrastic poem, John Constable, Study of Clouds, 1822. Carson was an Irish poet born in Belfast, born in 1948, passed away in 2019. I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about his poems and your relationship with them. You know, it's funny, I've, I've become uh, more of a fan in the last few years, and part of that was accidental because I started thinking about the Inferno as I got into this Dante project. And then someone wanted me to talk about the Inferno. I thought, really, I don't want to talk about the Inferno. I want to talk about the Purgatorio. And they kept insisting and insisting. And then they suggested this translation when I said yes. And I thought, no, I don't like his translation. And they said, why don't you like his translation? And then it became this, this whole investigation of what he was doing, which is really about music and about being Irish. And of course, it's actually a very straightforward translation, even though it's kind of wacky. And everything about Dante being translated is useful. So... I ended up liking it and it got me closer to his work and I started going back into older work where he had these longer, very dense city poems, long lines, and then he sort of moved away as he got into the early 2000s and maybe some of those are the poems I saw, the translations. And then this particular book, Still Life, from which the poem John Constable, City of Clouds, 1822, is taken, this poem I've chosen, is in this perfect book that really entranced me. So there's something about this book that's an entirely whole book, and it's coherent in the way that many books aren't, and that perhaps his other books aren't. Oh, that's really lovely. I don't know his poems very well, so I'm very glad that you've brought him in. Before I ask you to read it, I did want to give just a little bit of brief context about the Constable painting, which I'll link to in the show notes. This is from the National Gallery of Victoria, which has the painting. Clouds, is one of around 50 extant paintings of the sky which Constable made in Hampstead between 1821 and 1822, and it's been speculated that he produced more than 100 such studies at the time. Constable made his intense examination, which he called skying, to precisely record different weather and atmospheric conditions in preparation for his grand landscapes. He apparently saw clouds as essential to getting landscape right, which will end up being resonant with the with the Carson poem. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and read it. John Constable, Study of Clouds, 1822. The sound of water escaping from mill dams, etc., willows, old rotten planks, slimy posts and brickwork. I love such things, said Constable. Also, trees and wind and clouds reflected in the water as shown by his limpid water meadows at Salisbury. His father owned water mills and windmills. He understood weather from childhood. Of hail squalls in spring, he had this to say. The clouds accumulate in very large masses, and from their loftiness seem to move but slowly. Immediately on these large clouds appear numerous opaque patches, which are only small clouds passing rapidly before them, those floating much nearer 
the earth may perhaps fall in with a stronger current of wind, which drives them with greater rapidity from light to shade through the lanes of the clouds. Hence they are called by windmillers and sailors messengers, and always portend bad weather. Therefore Constable learned the craft of chiaroscuro. Ten years ago, it was your going through what had to be gone through. First the little blip, then the bigger blip. We'd scan the clouds for whatever augury they bore, clouds that bloom and dim from marble sheen to darks of silver at the edges, in the throes of being and becoming. Shown what showed on the screen, we wondered, what do we know of our bodies, the internal country undiscovered until now, and then not understood? Now it has befallen me to go through what will be. We gaze into the clouds and listen to the sound of water in the waterworks. I open a book to see what Constable recorded one day on Hampstead Heath, 31st September, 10 to 11 o'clock morning, looking eastward, a gentle wind to the east. The moving cumulus, caught on the fly between hand and eye, study, as in an act of learning, let's say a happenstance of Constable and Cloud, the final picture uninterpretable, quasi-shapely cauliflower plump with just a hint of dark top right to prove the chiaroscuro. I love the patience that you read that with. I feel like it, it captures something about, there's certain kinds of echoes of sound in the poem, but we'll get there. I'm curious just what the main reason you chose this poem is. There are there are a few reasons, and you know I didn't know them all when I when I chose them. The very first reason is that it was much shorter than the other poems, and I didn't want to take it too much of your time because many of these poems are three or four pages, like his early poems. Some go on for a very long time, and it's hard to kind of follow. And these are all about paintings. I thought you know study of clouds. Even if people are listening and they they can't see the painting right away, they know what a study of clouds looks like, and it's a painting that allows for a lot of imagination and possibility because clouds can be anything. And we always imagine forms in clouds. And he's he's a guy who's kind of interested in forms and frameworks. And then as the poem moves, he has these matching sounds as he's very good at, but these lines are much looser. And instead of getting too talky, he kind of sticks to the main idea. And he's got this very technical, factual, research-driven approach to all the poems in this book, but really to this one in, in the sense of he's focused on, on messenger and study and this list of fact over fact over fact as a way of trying to understand what's happening and what is life. So this big question at the end is just very dreamy, you know, what is, what will be since there's no idea. But I like the way he had the clouds in the background and other clouds moving in front of that. So you get a dimension which he's very good at, and that reflects the chiaroscuro. It's a poem that allows for a lot of things, and that's very technical and very detailed, and may not be necessarily the best poem in this book, and I really don't like the last two lines. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I didn't mind that, this, that they kind of made it fail a little bit. This book is not really about failures, but about endings. And so in his way, he has failed a little bit, he has failed to produce what he wanted to in the last four years of his life or so, and then he got his diagnosis. As he says on the next page in the next poem, he did not write anything publishable for four years until he got his diagnosis, and then he produced this book. And he was happy, and he went back to his long lines. It's that they were loose, looser because he was more mature. Well, I really, well, we'll talk about the last, the last two lines in just a moment, because there's something I like about them, but I also don't feel that they're, they fit the poem exactly. What I love about the poem is the the kind of sleight of hand in a way that for the first half of the poem, so much of it is quoting Constable and it reads like a fairly straightforward acrastic poem. And then the idea, therefore, Constable learned the craft of chiaroscuro moves us into this thing that has been so impossible for him to understand The it was going through what had to be gone through the little blip, the bigger blip. 
and it's it's as if he's trying to use Constable as a way of understanding something that is otherwise un- not understandable to him. And so all these things from the from the first half of the poem suddenly resonate, light to shade, very large masses. There are all kinds of phrases that kind of echo. But uh, tell me what you dislike, and I'll reread the last two lines. Quasi-shapely, cauliflower plump, with just a hint of dark top right to prove the chiaroscuro. So what do you dislike about those lines? Okay, I'll tell you first what I like about that line. I like the monosyllabic with just a hint of dark top right. So he's very good at meter and he's very good at timing. So he got that right and he he did that well. I guess the word quasi, this sort of Latinate, scientific, lifeless verb, feels strange right in the beginning. And quasi shapely, it's a it's a strange spondee that kind of grabs you in the beginning of the last line of the poem that should be a summing up. And this is a kind of big question, and in that a question is a kind of summing up that it, it makes sense, but this digresses from that and goes in an opposite direction. So there's a lot of big, big fat syllables, I guess. The cauliflower plump, the quasi-shapely, there's so much. It's a mouthful to say those syllables, quasi-shapely, cauliflower plump, even cauliflower plump. you think that that sound would have been unhappy to him. He would have been, <laughs> that sound would have been not welcome in his vocabulary, in his diction, because he he matches things, he connects things, he's got a lot of like he's he's got a beat going and he's got a rhythm and a music. And this moves away from the music and the way he phrases things that in the way that I understand. And it really just sort of stops me. I kind of get stalled. Like in the beginning, I think it's about eight lines down earlier when he says, of hail squalls in spring it has a thickness there too. You have, you know, syllables piled up, but that doesn't stop you. He has some assonance. He's moving around the vowels a little bit, hail, squalls, and spring. And so he could have done something like that here. So I, I just don't understand why he would have, of all the forms he wants to see in these clouds or might see, why he ended up putting a cauliflower in our minds. I was wondering about that because part of it is that the sound is. It's enjoyable outside the context of the poem, all the P's in it, the sort of strangeness of the image, but it's so different from the music of the rest of the poem and not in a way that feels like it's built up to. So I love the the kind of echoes we get. His father owned water mills and windmills. He understood weather from childhood. The line, we'd scan the clouds for whatever augury they bore. Clouds that bloom and dim from marble sheen to darks of silver at the edges in the throes of being and becoming. And there's a straightforwardness to the language and a simplicity to the language and quasi-shapely cauliflower plump feels just like it's from a different poem. The only connection I can make is that, and I don't know the nature of of the illness he's referring to. Um, The only connection- lung cancer. Lung cancer, okay. Then in this, then it, then my reading makes no sense because I I've seen the cauliflower uh, brain compared to a cauliflower. That's the only yeah. kind of connection I can make. Be, I might be wrong. That was just my quick quick search. I know it was cancer because he talks about chemo in the beginning, but I, oh. I thought it was. But it's a nice image. It doesn't really matter. You can read what you want into it because there's something wrong, right? I mean, there's something very wrong. Cancer is this bulbous, tumorous thing in your body. So it ends in the right place, movement wise, and that we get. The fi- or I feel the final picture uninterpretable, and and the thing is like it, I don't like the poem any less for it. Like <laughs> everything he's doing here is fantastic. You know, it, plenty of poems go off the road a little bit somewhere. So I'm I'm really everything that builds up to that I really really love. So well, those lines that you just quoted are some of the really they're just marvelous. The augury, just I mean, in the word augury, so much turns on that word augury in these clouds. You're thinking about these clouds, and you have all this information, and then suddenly it's an augury, and then that brings back something Homeric, that brings back myth and legend, and he's pulling himself into the past and and connecting himself. There is something to the kind of Homeric simile in here too, so that maybe accidentally connects the Homeric simile that I was thinking about connected. The augury brings him back to the Homeric idea of similes. And from looking at it, I kept thinking, well, the clouds of Constable are like the clouds of cancerous cells that appear on an x-ray screen. So, you know, we read what we want into it, but there is this sort of grand simile behind it. Something big and grand is happening, the end of life. 
and you have something very specific and research driven, just like these clouds. And then he brings in this weird simile and wraps it in. So he's not unfamiliar with everything that's out there before him. So the comparisons and the metaphors and the way he moves seemed resonant to me. And the poem is, I think, set up to so we make those kinds of connections because it's almost exactly halfway through that it turns from from the constable painting to to the illness and the ailment. And what's so fascinating is the way in which it touches on the on the illness only a little bit. Like it's it creates the emotional depth with things like the internal country undiscovered until now and then not understood, but then almost immediately turns back to constable. And it, it, psychologically, it's just this fascinating way of trying to talk about something that feels impossible to talk about, the depth of the sort of terror of of death and illness, and that Constable provides him a way of trying to understand it, but ultimately is not a complete way of understanding it. That's a beautiful way of thinking about it. You know, if you think about the clouds, you think about death and you think about sky or snow or clouds, it somehow makes it seem a little better. Like if... I remember once being on at the very top of a mountain um, overlooking many valleys of other mountains in Aspen. And I thought, oh, here I feel so close to the sky. And somehow this idea of death felt a little more comforting versus down in the city or wherever we are in our homes, in our beds, thinking about the other people. Here you're removed from people. The clouds kind of take you somewhere else. But it's a lovely idea. And that turn right in the middle is kind of... It, it sort of fascinates me, like with his earlier work, he has these associative leaps that keep the poem going and going and going, and even in his some of his prose, too. And they're punctuated rhythmically and over time, durationally, with music. So that's how he does it. And I saw that he did this turn here. I mean, you have sound in the beginning of the poem, sound at the end of the poem. You have the word chiaroscuro in the middle and then somewhere else at, right at the end. And then he turns from the craft of chiaroscuro to 10 years ago, which is associated, like there's really not much of a link there. But if you look at it, you think, oh, is he punning here? Because there's a rhyme, chiaroscuro, 10 years ago. And I thought he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have not recognized that. And he might have thought maybe that's fun. But it's just sort of like that where, that link that you pointed out, I noticed as well. It's funny. It, it makes me think of, and I don't think it's intended to evoke this, but a, a way of thinking of it is I've had a, a therapist tell me that Thinking, one way of thinking about mood is that it is like the clouds. The blue sky is always there and the clouds kind of pass and you always end up being able to see the blue sky again. Yeah. And so there's this interesting sense of scale that it was you're going through what had to be gone through, that there has to be some kind of acceptance that it's going to happen. First, the little blip and then the bigger blip. And blip is such a great word choice because the blip as a word, it's it's pointing to something so small. And yet here, the the scale of what it's changing in their lives is is so grand. He's turning on that like a beat again, like a like, like something you would do as a fiddler or something as a flautist. You get a note. Yeah. And by the way, I think we're the same therapist because I have that same or <laughs> <laughs> going. I, I feel like like therapists have Here, a, a they have a limited you know backpack of of <laughs> metaphors and sayings and so. I, uh, on a previous episode, I was talking with my friend Will Callahan, and I think I mentioned the, I think it's the the wild geese Mary Oliver poem that ends in, what will you do with your one wild and I've already forgotten the word life, and and Will said, you know, I was in the hospital once, and that quote was everywhere. <laughs> I feel like it's it's, <laughs> it's it's unfortunately for Mary Oliver, it's, it feels like it's become co opted as a kind of of, of mental really? health statement. The same way with the clouds. I wanted to just briefly reference, I love the phrase internal country undiscovered sent me back to the the Hamlet soliloquy, which if people were trying to place it, it took me a minute to place it because of the inversion that it's not undiscovered country, but the the country undiscovered. Who would fartles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will Hearing that echo helps it for me land that sense of heaviness that death is on the mind and there's that fear that comes with with this kind of serious illness. That's very moving. And and I like the way you tied it to Hamlet. I actually didn't even notice. I was just focused on the map implicit okay. right there where he says internal country undiscovered. I thought, oh, he's going back to his map metaphor because everything in his early work seems to be about a map. He's a city poet. He's a walking poet. And 
he often looks at things from an aerial view. And this is the other direction. So he's looking things from below up to the sky instead of looking from a hilltop down on Belfast and recognizing all the things that um, frame this painting, you know, the the pub and the this and the that and um, the bomb here and the this there. So, you know, it, he keep he connects to literature in a really de- in a really deep way. He connects to everything that came before. He connects to music. And, you know, in terms of like not knowing what's out there and the fear of death, I was looking through his prose book, which is this prose book about Irish music, which is it's sort of a memoir, but it's it's fun. It's called Last Night's Fun. He's got so many quotes in here that kind of ca- counteract and counter- contradict some of the things he says, his fears. For example, there was a line just in the middle of the book, a better time elsewhere is mere illusion. So I thought, you know, he's... <laughs> okay with this after all and then you know in terms of the the syntax i found something else and he was talking about music again there are dialects of moods decors atmospheres and um, ambiances and he's doing that here too he does that in his early poems i think he moved away from it in some of the middle poems because they're very thin small poems and he seems utterly lost like without a map but the dialects are in here, literally dialects. The, the mood changes when you get the blip, as you notice. That blip is kind of like a turning point. And then he's wondering, and then he's not so sure, but he's also okay. And then he turns everything into a cauliflower. Not in a terrible mood. He's walking around Belfast, around the waterworks with his wife, and they're having their own private conversation, and they're making the most of their time. He's making the most of his time. He's like, I'm going to make this really coherent book. And each one will be a painting. And if you think about it, like he's putting himself in this painting. He's putting himself in these clouds. And the thing that I always think about death is, well, this person died too. I mean, that's a ridiculous way to think. But it's also not a terrible way to think. I think, well, John Constable is also dead. Shakespeare is also dead. All these other people before me are dead. I also um, have to die. So if you connect yourself to other artists and other times, somehow it doesn't seem as bad. Well, it's it's interesting thinking about the kind of painting. The the constable painting is the kind of painting it's very easy to project yourself into because it's it's painted as that view. It, it's totally apart from landscape otherwise. It is simply this vision of the clouds that for most viewers could be anywhere. For him, it's very much studying the sky over Hampstead day after day and doing study after study. But it is the sort of painting that you can look at and you can be in its in its in its landscape because it's so simple and all we see are the clouds. It's true. And you know, the future he has to live through. He can be in the clouds. You can choose to be in the clouds. You can choose I like actually associating landscape with a place that people can go once they die. I have one friend who I associate with the snow in Colorado and her ashes there. For a long time I thought my mother was I couldn't figure out where my mother went after she died. So I thought, well she might as well be on the moon. So I would look at the moon. I think she could be on the moon. She's that's where she is. So it's sort of a nice concrete way to imagine people. And I, you know, when I, I go swimming at the YMCA for a long time, and I don't swim as much lately, but I'll, I'll go underwater and I'll see nothing but blue, and my mind will empty, sort of like these skies and these clouds. And then I think, well, my friend can be here, so I will meet her underwater, and you can choose to go there. So if you and I look up at the, the clouds, maybe. We will see Karen Carson more often now. That's really lovely. I love that. One last thing I want to note bef- about the poem before we turn to your poem is that so much of the poem is turned over to Constable's language and it works incredibly well. <laughs> like it seems like that's always a risk. And yet I feel that it, it it's similar to Carson's language while being distinct, especially this long quote, the clouds accumulate in very large masses and from their loftiness seem to move but slowly. Immediately on these large clouds appear numerous opaque patches, which are only small clouds passing rapidly before them. I think the lineation is helping in part with the kind of music that he's interested in. And, and, it, and it goes on for several more lines, which is seemed pretty amazing to me as a thing to have to include. Yeah. And the lines sort of flow. They're mellifluous the way he can be mellifluous. Mm-hmm. And then he has, you know, he has stops or stopping points here and there before and after. But, yeah, that's a huge chunk of the beginning of the poem. Mm-hmm. And they're in these unraveling, unrolling, unspooling lines. 
But you have these choice of words that he might choose himself, opaque patches. You know, there's a, a, a music to that. Well, let's let's turn to your poem now, Extended Melodies, which is from Tiny Extravaganzas. Extended Melodies. I worked all day, but nothing took, not even thought, would take a look, not still, nothing that was me mattered much. Tuneless, tuneless, and multiple, multiple, free. I kept it up and orchestrated some ensembles. Cello, bird song, violin. Auto tuned it, added symbols, and got the curve and score a personality wrong. My pitch too wide harmonically. Clatterings and shatterings, soundings universal escape my ears. Pursuing joy, enjoying trouble. Thank you. I have to ask immediately about the singing and also the echo of tuneless and then repeated tuneless and same with multiple because that's not on the page. And so I'm very curious. It's also in your bio about for you, the relationship between music and this poem and, and particularly the way that you are intoning it. Did I repeat tuneless and multiple? You did. You did. You said tuneless and then you sang tuneless and then multiple and then you, you hit multiple in a higher pitch. Oh, yes, I did. So sometimes... um I'm trying to get the word tuneless to be tuneless, and sometimes I'm trying to get it to be in tune, and I can't decide. So that was part of my indecision. So that was partly accidental, but maybe it works. I thought it's. I thought it was useful to start singing on tuneless because I don't particularly have a good voice, but I I can keep practicing and and use it in some weird way. So what was your question again? Well, you're very interested in sound. I'm curious to hear about the way you approach performing the poem, in particular in your bio, writing about working with musicians to invent a new way of working through sound together? Because I'm assuming there's a relationship between this poem and, and that project. Yes, this poem is very deeply connected to that project. So part of what I realized I was doing, which I didn't know until a musician told me, is using a musical lexicon increasingly and is throughout this entire book. And, it, and I, wasn't, I wasn't doing this before, but I can continually use a musical lexicon to talk about things that are not necessarily about music. And I think that was because I met a whole bunch of mus musicians while I was in Italy at this artist residency, and I started listening to what they were listening. I started asking a lot of questions, probably a lot of dumb questions. I didn't understand how contemporary classical worked. For example, I might hear long spaces of sound, of silence as sound, and I think that that's a very unclassical musical structure. I don't understand it. I think that there is no melody. And in fact, I'm completely wrong. So it could be that someone is stretching out a melody so much that you can't really hear. My ears can't hear the melody. So I realized that their ears were listening in a completely different way than my ears. And so every time I go to an artist residency now, I recite the poems differently. One, because the musicians have helped me. One in particular has helped me. And she said, slow down, slow down. And I already sl was relatively slow compared to how most poets read. And you have a lilt at the end of the line. So I've always been careful, but I, I went much slower. And I learned to use a different register of my voice, which I didn't know I had. I just assumed I have a terrible voice. And one musician said, musician said, no, you don't. You just are used to talking in your high nasally register. And I have that too. I just don't use it. So I started practicing. And then I realized that the poems could sound better. And then I started thinking, you know, I want to do a collaboration because this one woman asked me to do a collaboration. And I thought, oh, she's really, um, she's kind of legendary. And I was terrified. And I thought, no, thank you. And <laughs> she wanted me to improvise. So we're going to do it. And she's been teaching me. But meanwhile, since she lives in Amsterdam, I started improvising with a couple musicians in New York. And I made it clear I had asked someone at the Brooklyn, I live in Brooklyn, so I asked someone at the, who runs the Brooklyn Conservatory of Music, do you have a few musicians who'd be willing to work with me? And you can let them know that I don't want them to set my poems to music. 
I mean, how marvelous that would be. That's so nice and easy and fun. But no, I, I wanted to do the hard work of improving and to figure out something new because I'm in trance and I know that my poems are musical, but I, I don't know what I'm doing. So a couple guys agreed to work with me and I'm working with one man in particular who we sit and talk for a long time and we just have a good vibe going. And then he he kind of plays and I kind of talk and I try to go through poems, which mostly don't work. So it's sort of an experiment in failure because it's mostly me learning how to improvise as a musician improvises. And of course, the musician already knows how to improvise. This poem is about trying to write and have it not work. So it's sort of a good poem in terms of its theme to put into music. And it works well because it's short and it's not as dense as some of my other poems when using it in, in an improvisation. And so most of these improvisations work a little. I've been able to improvise some and not be completely terrified. We do it in my living room. And my goal is to perform because that is scary and um, difficult. But why am I doing this if not to get out of my comfortable skin? I love I love hearing about that. And it, bringing, you know, what you mentioned about the poem, this sort of feeling of starting with this idea of failure. Because I like that the, there's this simplicity of the poem that I don't know if it's intentional, but I worked all day. It made me think of Obad by Philip Larkin. I work all day and come half drunk, come home half drunk at night. My memory is not helping me today, but there's a simplicity to it and the abstraction of it. And the rhymes start fairly simple, took look free me. And then I love the rhyme ensembles and symbols, personality and harmonically. It just, it takes off and it has that, that feeling of like trying to work through something and then it just kind of, it rises. There's a Howard Nemiroff poem, because you asked about the line between prose and poetry, it's a very short poem. And it's the last line that I'm thinking of here that I'm reminded of, even though they, they're not the same line, but they embody, I think, similar idea. Because you asked about the line between prose and poetry, sparrows were feeding in a freezing drizzle that while you watched turned to pieces of snow Writing a gradient invisible from silver, a slant to random, white, and slow. There came a moment that you couldn't tell, and then they clearly flew instead of fell. And it's that line, the 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 move that feels like the move from the first few lines and extended melodies to to where all of a sudden it takes off. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. And by the way, I was reading Larkin Walls in Italy. I love Larkin. I love his 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 sad poems of old men dying. And <laughs> and so it could be that I that poem was in my my head and um, I stole a lifted part of the line. I have no idea, but that yeah, it took a while to write and it was maddening. I would not stop. I would not stop working on it. But yeah, you know, it was it was made me mad. <laughs> well, all the frustration paid off. You got it there. <laughs> so, are are you ready to turn to the silliness? Oh, definitely yes. All right. Well, <laughs> this the ad. The ad is a doozy. Before we get to the game, we have an ad. As always, strap in, folks. It's a long one. It seems like the world is always expanding, and what's been left behind for many of us is basic geography. That's why there is now the Poets Atlas. Combining the names of world capitals with the names of poets, the Poets Atlas will help you remember capitals of every country from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. Do the poets' countries of origin line up with their capitals? Of course not. This is about geography, not biography. Take, for example, the capital of Belgium, Brussels Edson, or Cambodia, Phnom Penh Warren, or India. Many people think it's Mumbai, but it's actually New Delhi Moore Schwartz. Yeah. Same with Canada for us provincial Americans. It's not Toronto, it's Otto Juan Felipe Herrera. The list goes on and on. Colombia, Bogotá, Gun, the Democratic Republic of Congo, why that's Philip Larkin Shasa. Zimbabwe, Harari et Mullen, Norway, Oslo, Simborska. Poets, you've been amazing your friends for years with poems you've memorized. Imagine that same skill with world capitals. Mauritius, Port Louis Simpson. Iceland, Reykjavik Victor Hugo. Brazil, that's Brasilvia Plath. Morocco, you might think the capital is Tangierard Manley Hopkins, but it's actually Rabat Frost. The capital of the Netherlands, why, that's Ossip. Mandel Stamsterdam. <laughs> okay, I'm being told by the publisher of the Poets Atlas that I can't list every country in the world, so let me remind you to buy the Poets Atlas edited by William Mapswell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Terrific. I, 
I I had a little too much. No, I loved it. My favorite is Rabat Prost and Mendel Stone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had my my friend did not laugh at the one I cut out, which was Washington D C D right. Um, that's pretty that's well good news. You're still here for the recording. On to the game. <laughs> Today we are playing a game I'm calling fittingly the Undiscovered Country Puzzles the Will. Diane, you've lived all over the world in places as wild and distant as New Jersey. <laughs> but in the theme of Chad, <laughs> uh, how well can you name the home countries of poets? I'm gonna give you a name and I'll ask you to tell me what country they're from basically born in in a couple of cases and i want to emphasize first i made a long list of names first and then tried to guess and i did horribly so i i whittled this down to a much more gettable list there aren't really that many tricky ones so there's no shame at least from my perspective uh diane meta are you ready to play the undiscovered country puzzles the will i am i'm going to fail i can't wait well we'll see uh, number yeah. one was was now I can't say her name was Lawa Zimborska, Poland. Poland it is, one for one. Number two, Federico Garcia Lorca, Spain. It is Spain. This I for whatever reason had it in my head that he was from South America, and then me too. I paused for a second. Right, I was thinking no, 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 no. I remember. Um, yeah, yeah. That was like that's that's it's that one long that makes me remember. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, number three, yeah. Mark Strand. I feel like this is a trick question. <laughs> England. He is from Canada. And uh. the reason I know that is I actually, on a previous episode, had a Canadian uh, comedian, <laughs> actually, on the on the show. And um, the ad was something to do with the a game of trying to name three Canadian poets. And, of course, everybody names Margaret Atwood. Uh, but they could never get to the third, which I discovered was uh, Mark Strand. So, uh, a Canadian comedian should go in that atlas. Yeah, it should. It should. Although I'm having enough enough difficulty getting out. Ossip Mandel's Stam der Stam Stamsterdam. <laughs> Number four, Charles Simic, country of birth. That's what I'm looking for here. Slovenia. Very close geographically. It's Serbia. When I guessed that, I guessed first uh, Slovenia, and then I guessed Slovakia. And then, and then, like, <laughs> fine. I'm, I'm just contemplating. Get, uh, number number five, Mandel Stamsterdam himself, Ossip Mandelstam. Russia, Poland. I, ah, okay. I we have, <laughs> we have the North Pole with number one, the South Pole with number five. Finally, number six, and you can answer this any way you want. Uh, you, Diane Meta. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. You can invent something that's wholly fictional if you like. <laughs> I'm going to say Bombay because you, you know why? Because I, I was looking at pictures the other day and I'm, I, I saw something and I immediately felt right back in Bombay. Like when you're a kid, you have certain memories. I was born in Germany, but I was only there six months. Nobody remembers that. There's something about having all my cousins around and, and, and being in a, a certain place first <laughs> that makes a difference, even if my connection to it is so, so far reachingly in the background now it's such a, it's always such a loaded question i mean i am from as prosaic a place as anywhere arkansas and when people ask me that here where i'm from and i say arkansas i can see a kind of cloud go over their face and it's just like <laughs> it used to be oh do you know bill clinton and now it's just like this guy has to be stupid <laughs> that's very funny you know where where in arkansas are you? i've been to arkansas so isn't that crazy that is i would i've been to the ozarks one little fancy Art, art sea town in the Ozark. So, did you go to Crystal Bridges, the Never. art museum? No. Uh, so, uh, one of the Walton heirs, I think Alice Walton, had an enormous private collection of art and decided to open a museum. Which it, it, it's really incredible the range of what they have. She had she had her her incredible collection and added a number of paintings as well and. Um, the one thing I'll praise Walmart for, and I don't know if this is still the case, but the, when they opened for 10 years, everyone could get in free because Walmart was basically footing the bill and helping fund. But it's it's in northwest Arkansas. And when it opened, I remember there was this review of it in the, in the New York Times that was huffy about the fact that it was in Arkansas. You know, <laughs> why should we have to go to northwest Arkansas for this? So, right. Anyway. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't answer your question. I was born in Pine Bluff and then grew up outside Little Rock and went to school in Little Rock. So oh, I see. I so I did actually go to junior high with Chelsea Clinton, which oh. is my 
I see. The closest I got to fame. This is a story no one will care about. So we, <laughs> wow. she was in, she was in a Christmas Carol. She was the ghost of Christmas Past, mm-hmm. and it was during election season. He had just won when we finally performed, and we come out for for our curtain call, mm-hmm. and it it's like this. He was this magnet. He's sort of sitting right in the center of the crowd, and everyone is turned toward him and trying to talk to him. <laughs> and we're up there taking our bows and our, oh. and our cheap costumes and everything. So, your Secret Service people around the whole time. Oh, it was great. Yeah. There was a Secret Service person behind the scenes with us. And he so there was an eight year old boy who got bussed over to play Tiny Tim. And half the time he was putting women's hats on the Secret Service agent <laughs> backstage. It was it was strange. So. And apparently when she went to Stanford, this is all the Chelsea Clinton news you want. The Secret Service guys were all dressed like they lived in Southern California. But you could see the earpieces. They're like these big muscular guys in T-shirts and shorts. Yes, and sir. dark glasses. And they think so. they, they don't stand out. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. They're, they're, the, they're the people in the classes not taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so, so very much for being here. Is there anything you would like to say or plug before we sign off? No, I just want to say thank you again from Mandel Stamsterdam. <laughs> that was pretty good. I spent a lot of time going through poet names and, and world capitals. So everybody, thanks for listening. Have a great day. Go read some poems, pet some dogs. And support striking workers wherever you find them, which, a quick note about that, if you're curious where people are striking near you, I'm adding in the show notes from now on the Labor Action Tracker, which is kept by Cornell School of International Labor Relations. So many thanks to them for maintaining that site. Bye.